So last night I did some work and I decided to write a Solana program that demonstrates some of the limitations that you might encounter while programming on the blockchain. Um, Solana is a very fast blockchain. It's able to confirm your transactions uh, relatively quickly um, and it's also fairly cheap to do so. Um, there are some downsides, however, in terms of like what your restrictions are when you're dealing with uh, programming on the blockchain. One example of something that can easily affect you is the size of the stack. So for this example, I wanted to talk about a program that, um, or a contract that I've been interested in designing for some time, uh, but haven't really had a chance to. And we'll kind of go through this exercise together while we try to build out a simple marketplace. So I have two copies of a struct here um, called Marketplace Borsch and Marketplace. There are only two differences between them, or one difference between them. Marketplace Borsch uh, uses the Borth, Borsch deserialization protocol uh, to load in the bytes of this object, uh, whereas this marketplace uses a zero copy uh, implementation to load in the data. Uh, what this essentially does is it makes a view over the account data and allows you to access the fields using the struct interface that I find here. Um, what the marketplace contains is really simple. There's the user, which is the pub key that uh, owns all of the offers in the marketplace. And the offers are just a list of uh, the different things that that user is trying to sell. Um, so as an example, an offer meant here, this could be some NFT that I own. Like say this is my marketplace, I own some NFT. The buyer meant here could be like USDC, it could be Sol, um, it could be BTC. But this is just the currency in which I'm, uh, I'm willing to take for what I'm offering. The offer amount, if it's an NFT, it will just be one. But in general, this could be some any, any amount of size. Uh, this is pretty similar to what you might see on a traditional order book. But there is no match strict matching algorithm implemented here. This is just kind of a, a list of things that I want to sell for a certain price. Um, so this would just be like essentially the price I'm asking price uh, the user is asking. What the marketplace is, is just a list of 256 of these offers. Um, so let's do some math here to see how large this actual object is. Um, I'll open up a Python terminal to do that. So if I open Python 3, all I need to do is calculate the size of this offer object um, and multiply that by 256. I know that there's two public keys, so that's 32 plus 32, and there are two 8-byte amounts, so that's 8 plus 8. I multiply this by 256, and I get uh, around 20,000 bytes. Um, oh, I also forgot to add the, the user public key. Uh, it's pretty negligible uh, compared to the rest of the, the large list of offers, um, but this becomes a fairly, I mean, and if you're, if, you're, if you're used to normal programming, this is like a negligible size object, right? Like th this, this is tiny. Um, but on the Solana blockchain, th this can be kind of dangerous because one of the limitations is you only have four kilobytes of stack available. Uh, and I can just show you how, how like ridiculously constrained this is uh, by, by showing an example in this program. Okay, so. I have a number of instructions here. I'll just go over all of these uh, quickly so we kind of know uh, the different types of things we're trying to check here. The first one is called stack. Um, this is just gonna me be me blowing up the stack in the Solana runtime, right? You have four kilobytes. If you load more than four kilobytes, your program is gonna complain. There's runtime. Um, the restriction in Solana is that you have 200,000 compute units uh, which are roughly correlated to the cycle cost of uh, individual instructions in BPF. This isn't an exact mapping, but this is another limitation that uh, the runtime enforces in the virtual machine that runs. Um, and every operation you do will inc uh, incur some compute cost. If you exceed this 200K limit, uh, that will cause some issues. There's CPIs. Uh, the, the, really the main thing here, uh, I didn't demonstrate one of the features, uh, it, most likely you won't encounter it, but you have a CPI depth of four. What this means is that you, if you have a program that makes a CPI to a program, that makes a CPI to a program, that makes a CPI to another program, that's as far as you can go. Um, so the stack depth of the CPI is sort of 
uh, how many layers deep you are from the first program that was invoked in the instruction. Um, the other more important limitation that I'm going to demonstrate in this program is that you're limited to allocating 10 kilobytes uh, for any account that you make a create account call to. So uh, max allocation of create account is 10 kilobytes. Also quite small. It's really, really easy to, to break that limit. This zero copy is just an implementation of an instruction that gets around that stack limitation. So as mentioned before, uh, it's possible to, in Rust to make a view over a set of bytes rather than copying that set of bytes to load a struct into. Um, and lastly, there's a transaction size limitation. This I think is set to 1232 bytes. And if you exceed this, your transaction won't even hit the network. Uh, and so for this exercise, I'm just demonstrating an example where I'm trying to send a vector, uh, not unlike the echo program. Um, however, if the number of bytes I send uh, makes the transaction size in increase over uh, this transaction size limit, uh, it won't even hit the network in the first place. <clears throat> what this should also tell you is that um, in that echo program that you guys are writing, there's a limitation to how much data you can send because past a certain point, it will exceed the size of a single transaction. Are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. Uh, could, could you repeat that last part? If there's a re-entrancy attack, you can still get more iterations, but not at all. There's a re-entrancy attack. So the question is that, like, with a stack depth of four, if there's a re-entrancy attack, whether you could still get that? Um, I, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question, but my understanding of how this stack depth works is uh, your transaction has a series of instructions, and each instruction that you execute cannot exceed four. So in, in the scope of one instruction, um, when that's being executed, uh, that, that like transaction tree can only hit four deep in terms of CPIs. Yeah, Richard? Oh, that, that's a good question. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do some research on that after the fact, but yeah, that, that's, that's certainly really interesting. Um, yeah, good question. I'll, I'll make a mental note. Okay, uh, with that, I'll move on and try to compile this program for the first time. Uh, the first thing I'll do, oh, it looks like something here is breaking. Uh, yeah, I didn't implement this yet, so let's delete that. Um, okay, so before I do anything, I'm gonna compile the, I'm gonna compile the program without the stack breaking so I can actually ex execute some instructions. The first one I'll demonstrate is the runtime. Um, this instruction is really, really simple. It takes in a max iteration parameter, which is a u size. Um, I'm gonna write a for loop between zero and that max iteration, and every time, uh, I is a multiple of 1,000, I'll just log how many units are used. By the way, this is a really useful um, function in the Solana SDK. What this will do is it will print uh, to, to the log buffer essentially like how many compute units you have used so far. So th this, is, this is like, the, or sorry, it will print the amount of remaining compute units. So if you're writing a program that is really compute constrained, it's useful to use this as a sort of trace to see how much uh, you're spending and how much, uh, how much buffer you have before you run out of compute. Um, so this is a really simple program. The only thing that's passed in from the client side is just this max iteration parameter. Um, and like I said before, um, all of this stuff is commented out because uh, otherwise the program's gonna break. I'll demonstrate that momentarily. Hmm. Notice that like even in these errors, or even in the initial compilation, 
there are some uh, lines here that already strike me as a little odd. Um, if you guys can see the text here, I know it's a little bit small. Let me maybe increase this a bit. Um, okay. Yeah, that's somewhat readable on the screen. Uh, there's something here that says that the stack offset exceeded the max offset of uh, this size, right? This is four kilobytes, uh, 20,592. That number seems kind of familiar. Let's, uh, let's try to see where we saw that before, right? Um, I think I ran a Python script a while ago uh, where I did exactly this. Hmm. Yeah, that seems pretty close, 20,512. Um, looks like there are a few extra bytes here. I guess that makes sense. There are other stack variables involved, um, but it seems like the majority of the stack offset is caused by uh, this number here. So that's something to take note of. Luckily, if you look into the processor, uh, that particular uh, function is never called. Like that marketplace borsh is never deserialized in any way whatsoever. So this program is not gonna fail immediately when I run it. Um, but uh, the first thing I'll do is I will test out the function uh, with the runtime. So let me open up that JavaScript file with my client and just quickly demonstrate how that works. It's a very simple program, not unlike the clients you've been writing um, for your project. Okay, I think that code is an acceptable size. Runtime. Simple, simple, simple instruction. I take in a number of iterations, uh, which is just taking um, some number, converting it into little Indian bytes, and then uh, writing or like creating the transaction instruction uh, with no keys because this, this instruction takes in no account data. Uh, and the data that's passed in is the instruction index, which is one, um, concatted with that eight byte string corresponding to the number of iterations. Runtime is invoked through the CLI. Um, this CLI is implemented quite simply. The first argument that I pass in uh, is gonna correspond to the index of the instruction, and if that index is equal to one, I'm gonna add this runtime instruction to my transaction, and at the very end, I will send that to DevNet uh, and log out the explorer, uh, the explorer, explorer link where we can analyze the, the logs. So, I think I have not uploaded that program yet, so let me do that real quick. That's concerning. Uh, to make this easier on myself, I also didn't include the program ID as command line argument. I just hard coded it into this script to make the demo run a little bit more smoothly. So I'll insert that here, and then I'll run uh, node index.js with instruction one and the number of iterations I'm trying to do. So let's say I do something simple. This is just a sanity check. 100 iterations should be totally fine. And it returns a success. If I go to the Explorer link, we see that I have plenty of compute remaining. I have like almost the full 200K, right? Because that's the maximum. Okay, so 100 is clearly fine. Let's up that to 10,000. Okay, that's not a problem. Uh, seems pretty okay. Uh, I have like 145K remaining. Um, that tapers off fairly quickly. Um, it seems like this thing is actually not the, it doesn't support as many operations as you might hope to. Um, and we can sort of try to escalate this by increasing this number massively. So let's try to go to 40K. Let's see, let's see how much remains after doing this. Oh, so it already failed when it hit 40. Uh, and we can see from the logs um, about where that happened. Okay, great. So we can see these numbers like quickly just going down to zero. And we see that the program here returned error. Uh, that, the, the text here might be a little bit small. Let me, let me increase the size of this. Okay, uh, a little bit more. So all this is doing is it's logging every time um, that iteration number is zero modulo 1000. And we can just see these numbers slowly declining over time. Um, and eventually it just hits zero and the program fails because you're only allowed 200,000 compute units. 
Um, just to sort of like, like represent the scope of this, right? That was uh, 40,000 iterations. Like your computer can do this like instantaneously. But the Solana runtime is very limited because you're trying to have a blockchain that can support a lot of transactions very quickly. So you're very compute bound. This is oftentimes like a huge limitation in a lot of programs that you're running. So you need to be a little bit like, like somewhat aware of your cycles when you're writing these programs because it's really easy to just run out of this. Uh, and we can sort of like isolate exactly where it failed. So let's just make a quick bin file. Right, so this is like around 35K, right? Um, because for every 1,000, it'll print something. So around 35,000 loops uh, were done, and this thing just failed. So in reality, like you don't have a lot of buffer room here. Uh, when you're writing programs, the compute limit is something to uh, keep in the back of your mind. Um, the ways to go about this are to uh, potentially stage your data over the course of many transactions. If you know that you're working on something that's very compute bound, um, ideally, you have things fit in a single transaction because that allows you to have atomicity. But if you're willing to design around that, then you can break things up over the course of several transactions and that can prevent you from running out of compute. So this is a pretty serious limitation that, uh, that should be uh, in the back of your mind whenever you're building more sophisticated systems on Solana. Okay, so we demonstrated the runtime and we know that it should work with 100, right? The Santa check that we did earlier is that the 100 is like, there's no problem in doing so, right? Uh, when you get to 40,000, maybe you have some problems, but at a, low, at a low number, like there's nothing that goes wrong. Um, but now I'm gonna go into the source code and uh, blow up the stack. Okay. Why is this breaking? Okay, so just going back to the, the logs again um, after compilation. If you guys remember last time, we only saw like two messages uh, that indicated like we had some problems with our stack. Uh, this time we see like a few more, so that should already be setting off some alarm bells. Last time, all of those instructions were happening in the state file uh, where we're deserializing, uh, serializing and deserializing this. But here we see one that also occurs in the processor file, uh, and this is uh, code that actually will get executed. So that should already set, up some, set off some alarm bells. Um, let's try to deploy this program again. And let's go back to our JavaScript file, or I can just do it from here. We verify that earlier, when we run instruction one with 100 durations, there should be no problems whatsoever, given that everything else was working properly. But this time when we run it, we'll see that it will fail. Uh, it says program failed to complete. Let's go back to our explorer and look at why this one failed. If we look at the logs, uh, it says we have like an access violation, right? Um, this is a consequence of the stack overflow. When, when we have a large stack object allocated, in this case, uh, like large is super relative, like 20,000 bytes is really, really not that much. Um, but if we allocate it on the stack in the Solana runtime, uh, it, will, it will brick every single instruction that you have. Um, so again, this is a serious limitation, and this is partially due to the fact that when you use Borsh, uh, all of the data will be copied into its own buffer, uh, which can be kind of dangerous when you're working with stack variables uh, of large size. So the, the main workaround around this and the solution is just don't copy all that much. Um, like try to be really conservative when you're working with stack variables. And really the right solution here is to uh, try to do zero copy deserialization. Um, and that's what, I'm de that's what I'm gonna demonstrate next. So I'll, I'm gonna comment out all this code, um, recompile and upload.
And while this is going, I'll discuss a bit about how this zero copy works. Um, the code is copy pasted from somewhere else. Um, if you want to use it, you can just copy paste it from here. Like, I don't expect anyone in this room to be an expert in Rust. So if you find code that works, you should just use it. Uh, this is like the, the paradigm that almost everyone that I know who works in Solana uh, or builds stuff on Solana does. You find code that is effective at doing what you're trying to do, and you just use it. It's open source. I implemented this trait called zero copy. Um, this, this is a part of, there's a library called ByteMuck that allows you to just sort of make views on top of data um, without copying it. Um, there are some helper functions from bytes, uh, and there are some traits, zeroable and pod, this refers to plain old data. Um, as long as you have these traits implemented, which is as simple as doing derive and putting these in here, there are some potential features that you'll need to like uh, work around with. Uh, I would recommend just looking at the documentation if you struggle with this. Um, but I have a trait here to make some of this stuff a little bit simpler. This is not strictly necessary. I could always just inline this inside the marketplace struct. Um, but these two functions will load the data from the account info um, into a struct that I can just access the fields directly. Um, and it, this allows me to do so without uh, explicitly copying all of the bytes from the data field in the account info into a new op object. Um, and I implement the zero copy trait for this marketplace struct, which looks identical to the previous one, um, as mentioned before. So this marketplace Porsche and this marketplace look exactly the same. Um, the only difference between these two is that the second one uh, implements traits zeroable and pod, as well as this zero copy trait. So when I try to load this in, and when I try to deserialize it, um, I'm not going to blow up my stack. Uh, things are just going to work as, uh, as intended, and the instruction is not going to break. And I will demonstrate that. So this zero copy, even though it's ordered second inside uh, this file in the processor, it corresponds to instruction index three. I just uploaded the program, and this takes in no arguments. So I should be able to uh, run this program just by invoking node on instruction index three and we'll see what happens. Great, that worked. Uh, if we look at the result here, it says that we assign marketplace to this user, right? Again, the idea behind this marketplace uh, really simply was to grab a user um, from the accounts and assign that user to that marketplace. There are a lot of checks that are missing here. In reality, if you're trying to build the system out, which I think could be a very feasible product, uh, would be to actually make the user a signer before doing this. Um, and you can add in a lot of checks uh, as necessary to make sure that um, all of this is possible. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really easy to just, using the interface, load in the marketplace object and assign the user. Um, and because we're looking at a view of the data, there's no need to explicitly serialize after uh, the user has been copied over. Um, there are, however, some very minor nuances with how this ByteMuck thing works, and this might be a gotcha, uh, potentially. So this marketplace uses Repr C, uh, which will align all the objects uh, to, uh, as, as they would be in a C struct. Um, one consequence of this is that uh, things will be aligned in eight byte chunks. So some things that might seem somewhat intuitive, like if I had a Boolean here uh, called is initialized, and this is a bool. Um, I'm not 100% confident that this is going to happen, but I'm fairly sure. Oh, I guess it's not potable. Let's try U8. Hmm. Okay. I, I mean, I guess, I guess these are things that are just going to break potentially, right? Because like this, this U8 type is a single byte. And this marketplace is expecting itself to have like an eight byte alignment. So there are going to be some issues that arise when you don't have objects that comply with this size constraint. So if I made this like a U64, which is eight bytes, it will no longer yell at me. I think it's also possible to like put in like a list of eight U8s. Um, I think so. Maybe not. There are definitely things that you can do here. Let's try like zero. There are definitely things you can do to sort of make this object sort of fall in line. 
So when I have like eight of these in a row, now it actually follows the like eight byte alignment. Uh, so th there, are, there are like tiny things you have to worry about when you use this like byte muck object. Um, if you don't want to be concerned about like these annoying memory issues, you can just make everything eight byte aligned. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? It's a little hard to hear. Uh, I think the total size of the struct has to be eight bytes. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, oh, 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 yeah, of course, yeah. So I, I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the question is whether the size of the object needs to be a multiple eight bytes. Uh, to my knowledge, and how I've always gone about this, is that I, whenever I use byte muck, I just make sure that the size of the object is a multiple eight bytes, because uh, I just don't want to deal with any of these memory issues. You're paying like a very, very small cost in terms of uh, like rent, if if you like allocate a few more bytes, and you save yourself the pain of having to debug through like memory issues. So I would always recommend you do so. Uh, are there any other follow-up questions? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, if there's an analog to something like attribute packed in these struct, uh, in these structs, and the answer is that you could. Uh, there is a wrapper pact that you can uh, apply to these objects, and I think this will allow you to sort of represent this in a packed format, but uh, I think that ByteMuck is uh, not very happy with this attribute. Uh, notice how the pod starts highlighting up. I think it has to do with the fact that like, when you're viewing this data with this particular uh, package, uh, it, it is looking for a particular byte alignment. What I will do next, uh, sort of demonstrating the ByteMuck stuff a bit, the next thing I'll do is sort of show you uh, the CPI limitations, right? This is something I actually learned fairly recently. Um, it's not entirely obvious uh, up front that this is a limitation, but when you allocate an account, uh, there is a certain maximum size that you can allocate. Uh, and if you try to allocate an account in line, like with a CPI, and you exceed that size, the entire transaction is going to fail. Uh, in this really simple instruction, all I'm doing is I'm making a CPI call uh, with some size variable that will be the size of the account that's being allocated. It's all, all it's doing is just allocating that struct and assigning it to this program. Um, and the way in which I invoke that is that this is instruction index four. Or three. Or two, two. It's index two. So when I run this against that and I pass in some object of size 100, um, as we did before, there should be no problems whatsoever. If I go to 9,000, there aren't going to be problems at all uh, because we haven't exceeded the limit. But the second I exceed that limit to something like 12,000, then I'm going to get an error or different error. The devnet has a lot of rate limiting issues, so if you try to hit the network too many times, uh, this is often a problem that you'll encounter. Okay, so this time it just failed. Uh, I tried to allocate an object with 12,000 bytes. Uh, we'll see what that looks like in the logs after I paste this transaction here. So in the logs, it says that create account data size is limited to uh, 10,240, 10 kilobytes in inner instructions. So the consequence of this is that any kind of inline um, or like in program CPI to create account uh, cannot exceed this size, which means that there is a maximum size of uh, your PDAs if you try to allocate them in a single instruction. Um, I believe that there is a way to allocate PDAs of larger size over the course of multiple instructions, but that to me is not very well known. Um, I am not familiar with the interface to do so. So for the most part, if you're trying to allocate PDAs, um, it's recommended to keep them under 10K because uh, if, you, if you don't do so, you'll come across this issue where uh, the runtime has a limitation that prevents you from exceeding this uh, maximum allocation size. So uh, when you're designing programs, this becomes a constraint as well. Uh, if you want to make very large accounts PDAs, uh, it becomes quite difficult to do so. The cleaner interface to do that would be to use a normal key pair and allocate it with create account um, outside, uh, inside the client code, and then use that allocated client inside, uh, use that allocated account in the program and modify it. Um, in the example I have here, 
Uh, that is what I did for the marketplace object, which had uh, 20,000 or so kilobytes, or it's 20,000 or so bytes. Uh, here. This is already pre allocated. And if I open up the JavaScript file where I do this, uh, we'll see that this is instruction four. I call create account um, with the size of that object um, to sort of preempt. Oh, sorry, that's not the right one. Is that the right one? This is the one. I call create account with the size of that object to sort of preempt uh, anything that could happen with uh, that allocation. Okay. So the, the next thing I wanted to go over was transaction size limitation. Um, I believe that's the last instruction that I implemented. This will also be kind of a hint for those of you struggling with instruction zero on the Echo project. So this instruction uh, is called TX. It takes in a data vector uh, of just arbitrary bytes. Uh, and then what the program will do, um, which you might find somewhat interesting, is it will just take the buffer uh, and take those bytes and copy it into the buffer. I even have a little hint here that like this is just echo, right? You're taking, you're taking that uh, buffer and copying those bytes. Cool. Pretty simple. Uh, so if I wanted to run this with say, oh, by the way, the way that the, uh, the, way that the CLI works for this instruction is um, I pass in the size of the vector, uh, the amount of data I pass in. And then when I run the actual instruction or when I compose it, um, I just add random bytes into a list. So what it will do is it will log a string of random bytes and the size of that string is equal to uh, the size that is passed in from the client side. So let's just demonstrate that real quickly. This is instruction index four and if I wanted to log a buffer of size 50, that should be no problem whatsoever. We see that uh, this uh, entered our program and it logged some random jumbled byte string. Easy enough. There become clear limitations though when we increase the size of the input uh, to something like a thousand. So if we wanted to log a string or copy over a string that was larger than a thousand bytes, uh, what's going to happen is that the program is going to fail. Uh, or m sorry, to be more exact there, uh, it doesn't even hit the program. We get an error log here that says the transaction is too large. Um, this is the number of bytes in the transaction when you serialize the object. Uh, it serializes down to um, about 1,300 bytes. But the maximum transaction size is limited to 1,232 bytes. So in this particular example, the limiting factor of what caused our transaction size to grow too large was that data input that we passed in. Uh, this particular instruction takes in a, a vector of bytes and that byte vector uh, had too many entries in it. Um, and the transaction is not only the byte itself, uh, you have to pass in all the public keys that are involved, you need to pass in the signatures. There's a bunch of metadata that's encoded in this transaction and even though it's densely packed, um, there are still clear limitations to how large this thing can be. Uh, in this case, the thing that pushed it over the edge is uh, the actual uh, size of the data that's passed in, like the data for the instruction. But oftentimes, uh, the limiting factor is the number of addresses you can use. Um, if you're working with accounts, every single public key that you're going to be touching in your program needs to be part of that transaction, and those public keys are 32 bytes. So just to do like some quick Python sanity check, um, we have 12 32 bytes total and each transaction is 32 or, or each, each public key is 32 bytes. Um, this would give us like a naive division of 38, uh, but obviously the transaction contains more things than just the public keys itself. Uh, you have to include all the transactions as well as signatures. So realistically this number is a lot lower than 38. Uh, the, the limitation here is like very clearly when you're designing programs, you want to be really careful about the number of uh, different accounts that program is going to be operating on because it's possible that if you exceed a certain number, uh, there's no way that a client could ever interact with that particular program. 
So uh, that sort of covers um, the main limitations that I think uh, you might encounter when working with Solana in the runtime. Um, these are all design, like when you're designing systems, these are all things to think about because each one of these can sort of uh, make or break the success of a particular program. Uh, when you're thinking about how like a user might interact with things or how efficient something might run. Um, to give kind of like a really naive example that I haven't really implemented yet, um, let's think back to this marketplace object. Suppose I wanted to build um, uh, like a de facto matching engine between two marketplaces. I have say two users, uh, each with kind of a list of offers, and I want to see if any of these offers cross each other. Um, in the case that it does, you can do some averaging maybe and decide like a fair price between these two users uh, just by looping through these objects. Um, these objects have 256 entries, uh, and if I were to do this naively with an n squared algorithm, that will blow past uh, what we determined to be the max iteration limit. Uh, when we took the iterations, that was around 35,000. Uh, 256 squared is greater than 35,000. So you have to be more efficient and you have to think a little bit about how to uh, design these systems in such a way that you can avoid blowing through any of the limits that uh, the runtime uh, provides or like enforces when, when you deploy smart contracts. Um, I think that's all I really have for this lecture. Um, I'll share all of this code so you guys can have access to it and you can run and test for yourself if you're interested in, in sort of pushing the limits of some of these constraints. Um, before I end, are there any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was whether macros like sole law compute unit, uh, this, this function I have here, whether that uh, uses compute units. I believe the answer is yes. Um, there is a file in the runtime uh, or in the Solana repo, the public GitHub repository, that has a list of all of the compute costs of different operations. Uh, and so I believe that logging the compute costs does map to some number. I don't know exactly how much it is, but um, I believe it's like quite negligible. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, given that I see no more hands, uh, that'll be the end of this lecture. Best of luck with the rest of Project One. I'll be walking around to help with that, and uh, sometime in the afternoon, we'll announce over Discord, we'll have a discussion about um, designing the exchange booth. Thanks so much.